Hi, Paul Sackis. Good news, Planet. I'm speaking to John Fredrickson. Hi, how are you, John? Fine, and thanks for having me on. All righty. Well, I'm very uh, pleased and honored to get a moment or two to speak with you. Uh, you've written a book. Actually, it's uh, after you've had a great successful book with the, for the therapist, actually, a prize winner, uh, Co-Creating Change. Congratulations on that. Thank you. The Lies We Tell Ourselves, How to Face the Truth, Accept Yourself, and Create a Better Life. And uh, it's very interesting. I'm going to just say a couple things that I think then when we'll start to talk about them that people mm-hmm. might find interesting, at least I have, okay? <laughs> Why no one needs to be fixed, all right? But then <laughs> dot, 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 okay? There's dot, dot, dots after all of these, okay? Why yeah. grief, shame, guilt, and rage are not problems, dot, dot, dot. And Mm -hmm. while taking responsibility for life we created is so much harder than blaming others, dot, dot, dot. And Mm -hmm. how what is wrong in us often points to what is right, dot, Mm -hmm. dot, dot. All right, Mm -hmm. let's let's start off with, uh, and this book covers these thinking, so uh, and these thoughts from John. So why no one needs to be fixed, okay? I'm going to write that in big capital letters here. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, you know, a lot of times uh, people come to therapy with the idea that um, they just need to reject certain aspects of themselves so that they would be acceptable to other people. Hmm. So they can, they can convert therapy into a kind of emotional ethnic cleansing. Like, I shouldn't feel this way. I shouldn't think this way. I shouldn't have these urges. And so in a way, oftentimes people come from backgrounds where they were asked to reject certain feelings or thoughts or ideas in order to be loved by close ones in their family. And so they oftentimes enter therapy with the idea that they need to be fixed, meaning that they need to be made into someone else. So the thing is, is that oftentimes when you treat yourself as if you need to be fixed, you're actually in a secret form of self-rejection. And maybe the first step might be just accepting yourself just the way you are as a first step in the healing process. And one way we can look at it where it's really obvious is you oftentimes see people where they treat their spouse as almost good enough to be loved, but they just need to fix one or two things. And so they end up treating their spouse as sort of like a home renovation project well, you know, you would look so much better if you lost weight. Or why are you wearing that? You shouldn't be wearing that. Why are you doing this when you should do that? Why are you wanting this when it's not the same thing I want? And so oftentimes we can kind of do a kind of violence with ourselves by continually trying to make ourselves into not us. Or we can do a kind of violence with our spouse by asking our spouse to fit our fantasy. You know, if you would just get rid of these traits and add these ones, then I could I could have a relationship with this fantasy spouse I'm waiting for instead of have a relationship with you. And oftentimes, we've you know, many of us can think of that in our own marriages. Oh, I wish my spouse was this way or that way. And then we're relating to the fantasy spouse in our mind rather than the real spouse we have. And oftentimes, people wonder if they need to get divorced. And I say, yes but it may be that you need to divorce your fantasy so you could, so you could get married to reality instead. <laughs> this is good thinking. I like your thing. I'm on the same page with you. Uh, uh, just leave everybody alone, including yourself. <laughs> well, you know, it, you know it, it's so funny, but as, as I'm sure you found, a lot of times we spend a lot of time trying to put out the fires in others with the hope that it will put out the fire in ourselves. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. You know, and that we, it might, it, oftentimes we think we're fixing other people when we're trying to fix something in ourselves. And we might want to just leave other people alone. Yeah. <laughs> and, I like and it. Fix, and, and fix what's happening in us. I think Michael Jackson said, look in the mirror and uh, you'll figure it out. Uh, it's, it's all about <laughs> us. Uh, and I am involved, we're all involved here with the World Peace Movement. And I, I'm a de- definite believer that, I mean, if everybody left everybody alone just on one day, I bet you we would have peace on that day. <laughs> Ab- absolutely. absolutely. We'd have world peace. If everybody just took care of their own uh, doormat, their own self, nobody would be bothered. Nobody hit anybody. Nobody would do anything. We would just be a happy campers. Exactly. You know, 
Because whatever we judge or we don't accept in another person is really something we judge and don't accept in ourselves. So in a sense, when the things... Uh, when we're really upset with people, we have to understand that in a way it's almost everything that we disavowed we've placed in them. And so the people that bother us the most are oftentimes just, are they're like homing pigeons. It's like whatever we didn't like in ourselves, we put in other people. So when we're around them, they really bother us. But it's really the aspects of ourselves that we've exported into them. And, and they're just bringing it closer to home. It's like whatever we don't like ourselves, keeps coming back to us waiting to be accepted. But we, we think we're upset with the other people, but we're upset actually with some aspect of ourselves that we're trying to relocate. And very interesting. What, why, let's go to the next. There's all the, you have a lot of good thoughts in this book. Why grief, shame, guilt, and rage are not problems to be avoided, but signs of our true self and paths to heal. What do you think? Exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, these are human experiences, right? And we tend to, tr- we often make mistake of treating human experience as something we need to get rid of. You know, for instance, when, when someone, let's suppose a dear person dies, we feel grief. And oftentimes people treat grief as if it's, as if it's a problem, as if it's something to get over. Whereas really, the way I talk about it in the book is that grief is really a communion with the truth. You know, the truth is we really love that person. The truth is we're having to let go of some illusions. Maybe the illusions were that life goes on forever or that or that we would not have to suffer this loss. But grief is really a communion with the truth, and we are healed through that grieving. We're healed by getting reunited with the truth. And that when an illusion peels away, it's painful, uh, but there's a healing in that we become closer and united with the truth. Um, people oftentimes talk about shame as if it's a terrible thing. Now, there is such a thing as people being ashamed of things they shouldn't be shamed about and where they'll shame themselves. But we also have to remember that when we call people shameless, it's not a compliment, <laughs> right? Uh-huh. Uh, because, and, because in a sense, shame is simply pointing out that you've done something that departed from your best self. You've done something that's departed from your own ideals. And so, in a way, shame is like a homing device saying, look, come home. Come home to your ideal. You, you were meant to be something better than what you just did. So in that sense, we think shame is a terrible thing where it's, in fact, it's trying to reorient us from a terrible thing we did so we can come closer to our ideal. With the understanding we'll never be the same as the ideal, um, ideals are sort of like the North Star. When you're sailing, you can look at the North Star and know where North is so you can reach your destination. Yet no matter how far you sail, you'll never reach the North Star. But it is an orientation. And the same thing, shame is just a signal, oh, you're, you've got off course. Same thing with guilt. Guilt has gotten a terrible name. You know, some people, you know, they suffer from a lot of self-punishment, and that's totally different from guilt. When, when guilt occurs, it's we've hurt someone we love. And guilt comes up, and it's actually a sign of our love. Guilt tells us, wow, you hurt someone you love. And guilt actually mobilizes us to reach out to that person. It mobilizes us to repair the damage we did. So in a way, if you didn't feel love, you wouldn't feel guilt. So people think guilt's a terrible thing, and I say, no, it's just a sign of your love. It's an indication that you see that you damaged a relationship and you're feeling an urge to repair the damage. It's just, it's so painful to feel guilt that oftentimes we'll avoid reaching out to repair the damage, and we may punish ourselves in the privacy of our home. You know, and if someone will say, oh, I feel so guilty, I feel so guilty, and I'll ask, yeah, um, so did you apologize? Well, uh, no. So I say, so then this is not guilt, this is self-punishment. Because it's interesting with the self-punishment, however nice it sounds, it's narcissistic withdrawal, right? It's much harder to face the person you hurt and apologize and repair. But that's what guilt is mobilizing you to do. So in a sense, it's, it's it's understanding that there there are really good purposes to these emotions. 
Well, I'm going to keep on going here because I want to, since I have mentioned that, uh, and as I said, we can go uh, spend a long time on each one, but uh, Mm -hmm. we're just not going to have time today. But why taking responsibility for the life we created is so much better than blaming others? Well, the, the, the thing is, is if we blame others, then we better have 10,000 lifetimes because if we blame others, we're waiting for them to change so that our lives will change. And then you simply make yourself the hostage of someone else's neurosis. All right. right. You know, if you, you say, well, my, my problems are because of my husband or so-and-so, then in that way you're saying, I can't really do anything. I have to wait until this person changes until I change. You know, Byron Katie talks about this in terms of why not cut out the middleman? You know, they're like, I'm going to wait till he changes first and then I'll change. Well, you could spend a lifetime doing that, but then you would be actually the architect of your own suffering. And without realizing it, you have found a secret way to punish yourself while blaming someone else for doing it. Yabadoo. Yabadoo. <laughs> a psychiatrist once told me that the opposite of love, he said, what's the opposite of love? So I guess many people would say, hey. He said, no, it's uh, it's uh, not caring. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. How what is wrong in us? I hope you don't mind me going like that. I don't usually even do like this, but I just feel that each one of these you have something very, very um, contrary to the norm of the way to look at it, and that's why I'm doing it. I just want to let you know. Yeah, How, absolutely. Wrong? And and that's a good thing. And so that's a, because you have a very brilliant, interesting perspective of life. I'm going to say, and that's mm-hmm. what I I find uh, find worthy of sharing. With, with an audience who I think might not be looking at these kinds of things like death, okay? Death is, uh, you know, how do you look at death? Is it, uh, is it that bad? Is it good? Is it, it is what it is? What, however, you know, each one of these things uh, uh, have a lot to do with the way we live our lives and the way we mm-hmm. accept it. It's like doctor. It's like surgery, right? And the medical, mm-hmm. you know, is it, is it good that uh, they found out that you have uh, uh, some cancerous growth going on in your body? Um, or is this the worst thing in the world, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they take it out, maybe they're going to save your life, right? Um, mm-hmm. So uh, many things are uh, strangely better for us that seem to be at the time not such a good idea. So here's the last one. How what is wrong in us often points to what is right. There's a um, well, actually, the example I used in my book is a good one. Uh, there was a woman who came to me. She uh, was a recovering drug addict. And uh, when uh, when she was using drugs, she didn't want her children to see it. So she asked her former boyfriend, who was their father, to take care of the children because she was really addicted to cocaine. She was, uh, and to support her habit, she was acting as a prostitute on the streets, you know, to support her habit. And while she was on the streets working as a prostitute, she learned that one of her daughters had been molested by this, their father. So, of course, she felt enormous guilt, enormous guilt. And she had been punishing herself in just horrific ways ever since. And... uh, and she came to me and she said, I know something's wrong with me. I, 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 I know something's wrong with me. I don't know what right is, but I know this isn't right. You know, she was even hallucinating a voice that was telling her to use drugs, right? And, uh, and then, when, and then interestingly, when, when she would use drugs, then the voice would not be punishing her. But when she stopped using drugs, then this voice would be punishing her, telling her what a horrible person she was, right? Now, this self-punishment, what seemed wrong was actually pointing something right. Why was she punishing herself? Because she felt so guilty. And she said uh, all the other therapists had had told her she needed to forgive herself. You know, she shouldn't feel so guilty. She needed to get over it. And she was afraid I was going to do the same. And I said, this guilt you feel is the most beautiful part of you. I said, you wouldn't feel this guilt unless you loved your daughter. And I have no right to take this guilt away from you since it's the most beautiful part of you. And even if I could, I have no right to. 
Mm. You will feel this guilt the rest of your days because you love your daughter. Mm. And we see that this guilt is so painful, it's so excruciating, that you've been tempted to punish yourself. But no matter how much you punish yourself, it will not undo what your husband did to your daughter. And no matter how much you punish yourself, even if you punish yourself by, if you punish yourself and use drugs again, you'll simply abandon your daughter again. And she mm-hmm. suffered enough already. So in a way, you see the self-punishment pointed to the guilt and it actually pointed to what was right in her. You know, you think, my God, this woman's a drug addict. She's a prostitute. And yet this guilt pointed to something very sacred and beautiful in this woman. Wow. And, I, John, and, I think that's, and I think that's the major reason that she was able to recover and not use drugs again. Doing good work here, John. Last two quick questions, okay? And thank you very mm-hmm. much for the lies we tell ourselves. Now, face the truth about accept yourself and create a better life. Uh, what's good news for you? What would be considered good news for you? Good news for me is mm-hmm. just that every day uh, reality is constantly inviting us to reunite with the truth. Mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm. every person who's making us uncomfortable is is bringing something to us to be embraced, to, to heal us so we can embrace whatever we've rejected and become more whole. And that every day life is always giving us a chance to become more whole. It's a new day. All right. I love it. Last question, Larry. I mentioned earlier on that we're involved with the International Day of Peace and the World Peace Movement. And so I've asked many people, what does peace mean to them? So, John, what does peace mean to you? Peace, uh, peace to me means accepting everything that's inside you is inside you. Whenever we take whatever's inside and put it outside, we become at war with ourselves in reality although apparently it looks like we're at war with others. But, but, but that, that apparent war with others is really because we're at war with ourselves. And peace is really taking back inside whatever we placed outside and really coming to embrace the fullness uh, of our humanity. Love it. Where can people get the book? And do you have a website? Yes. And the website is where? Um, you can go to, uh, you, can, uh, you can find it at ISTDBinstitute.com. The book's available there, and, of course, the book's available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Okay, John, great, uh, great work. Thank you very much for sharing it. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you so much for having me on. Okay, you take care. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye.